Hey everybody, welcome to Comp 2300, back in week six. We're going to start the lecture up in a minute, just waiting for people to get online or uh, wake up. <laughs> it's always a bit tricky to have a nine o'clock lecture and probably even more tricky now that um, you're at home, but at least you don't have to actually get to a lecture theatre, you can just watch this on your phone if you want to while eating breakfast or relaxing. I'm just going to make sure I'm up to date with the chat. <laughs> I wonder if I can get two windows up at once so I can see the chat in from all things. Waking up is a struggle sometimes. Um, <laughs> I have to make sure I'm waking up early enough so that I can remember how to actually give my lecture. <laughs> yeah, good day friends. Oh, it's great to see people in the, the streams chat as well. Um, this is really excellent. It's really nice to have you, um, you folks all coming to join me for these live streams. Um, and I hope that you think today about some questions that you might want to ask. Um, you can always pop things in the chat and if I don't remember it, maybe you could just uh, make sure that you <laughs> remind me of the question when we get to one of the question answering parts of the lecture today. Um, so we've got a couple of topics to um, get through today. First of all, I just want to say a huge well done to all you folks who handed in Assignment 1. Um, we had just such a wonderful response for Assignment 1 on the Piazza in the last week uh, with people throwing around some really great questions. Um, you know, they, they were questions that really enhanced the experience for everyone and I think that that's the the kind of thing that I really hope that you guys um, put out there and it's, it's wonderful to have them when they, when they appear. So it was great to have those assignments coming in um, at the deadline. The tutors are working on grading them for you and we will get the results back for you after the mid-semester exam on Friday, um, sometime after that, uh, but not too long after that. So that brings me to the next kind of logistics topic. Next, this Friday, um, we don't have a lecture. I'm going to use the lecture time to give everybody the mid-semester quiz. Um, probably everybody watching this stream right now has had a look at the mid-semester practice quiz that I put on Wattle. So the idea of that practice quiz was that I took um, most of the questions from previous mid-semester exams and practice exams that would work in a Wattle quiz and put them together with a few new questions um, and put this into the Waddle quiz format specifically so that you could practice doing a quiz within that online um, format. Of course, an online quiz is a little bit different than a regular um, uh, exam or an in-person exam. Um, the main reason being that it's um, definitely going to be open book, right? You're at your computer, you're at home, you can access all the resources that you might want. That means you'll have your disco board, you'll have VS Code. So there is a particular class of question from previous mid-semester exams which is basically you having to remember something under pressure and now that kind of question is not so useful here. The questions I'm going to be asking you as you can see in the practice exam are to get you to do some a quick little bit of code under pressure, um, answer some quite tricky multiple choice questions um, that really tests your understanding. So they, they might have uh, options which are common confusions or common misconceptions about the topics. And also questions where you have to write some short answer responses, um, you know, one or two paragraphs to explain a certain concept or to imagine how something might be if it was different. So that's a, a typical kind of question. What if we were designing a new CPU and instead of the way it's done on the disco board, we do something completely different. What is that going to mean? Um, so that means you have to understand uh, how we do things on the disco board well and sort of be ready to explore other options um, with your imagination a little bit. So these are quite, quite tricky questions. I encourage you to get into the practice questions this week and do ask a lot of questions on Piazza. Um, the one question on Piazza that I'm, uh, you know, my heart sinks when I see it is when there's a a question comes up about a an error in one of the practice exam questions. Well, you know, 
Um, some of them were taken from previous practice quizzes where they weren't quite proofread uh, as uh, well as they might have been, but um, uh, I always try to <laughs> just make sure that the questions actually make sense when they're on the real exam. But great that people are figuring, figuring some of those out. Now that we've done the logistics part, um, let's jump into the content for today. So I wonder if my macro pad is going to work. <laughs> Nope, that, that didn't work anyway. Just waiting to see if my stream catches up. No, it did work. I'm just a few, few seconds behind on my laptop. So the topic for today is, well, this is the main topic is assembler macros. That's the only thing which we're doing, which is new. Um, we're also going to talk a bit, a little bit about compilers. Um, and actually, I think the first thing I want to do today is to um, give you a little demo of how we might do some recursion um, on the disco board. So there's been, just been a question in the chat already. Will the MedSim have questions on macros? Yes, macros is a available topic for the mid-semester exam. Macros is a topic in this course, it's covered this week, exams on Friday, so it's a, a topic which is under consideration. Um, before we get into the, the, that lecture material, let's just go back to VS Code. I know we normally don't start with a demo, but let's do that today just to get everyone's brains warmed up. And I want to make a recursive function. So one of the classic recursive functions that you would do for a, an example is probably the factorial function. So you remember, if, you, if I have like four factorial, that's gonna equal four times three times two times one. Okay, so that will be, you know, four times three is 12, that's 24 equals 24. Gotcha, so that's pretty easy. Five factorial is gonna be five times four times three times two times one. I think you've probably seen these ones in previous in maths and also maybe you've done some recursive examples in previous computing courses with these kind of questions. Um, a few special cases, one factorial is one, obviously it's one times nothing, just one, and zero factorial is actually also one, that's just um, by definition. So we're going to make a factorial function and I'm just going to imagine that I've made it. I'm going to call it bl, uh, call it fact. That's the name of my function, and I'm going to start by just um, setting up my function call. So as you know, um, for function calls, we need to have our way of getting the parameters into the function, either through registers or through the stack. Um, and right now, we're just going to do it with registers. So moving r zero, moving five in r zero, and then calling my factorial function. So now we have to write the factorial function. How do I write a function? Well, a function just starts with a label, doesn't it? So I've got my label, and then how does a function end? You always end a function with a return to the link register. So it's going to be bxlr. So now I'm getting from factorial to my function there, and then back again with bxlr. So that wasn't so hard so far. Now, for this function, we're going to imagine that the parameter um, comes in on R0, in R0. Okay, and then we're returning um, our, our output value in R0 as well. Now, we get to the tricky bit. We actually have to do this recursion. So, Maybe you'll remember from previous courses, the, the way that you have to work out recursions is that you'll have different cases for your input value. And one of the cases will be the base case and the other cases will be the inductive cases. So for a factorial function, the base case is going to be one, right? Because there's, then you're just returning the same value. I guess we could make the base case zero and then we're multiplying it by uh, we're just replacing it with one. So, well, maybe we can do that because then the, the second one will be one times one. So what if I do uh, base case 
is r0 equals 0. This is going to work. So I'm going to compare r0 to 0. I guess I could have just, yeah, well, that's, that's going to work. r0 compared to 0. And now I have to do a conditional branch if the output of that is, is 0. So this means I'm going to go to another label. I think I'll call it base case. So if r0 is 0, I go to base case. And then I return my um, correct value, which is 1. So I'm going to mov 1 into r0. I um, hope I haven't made any mistakes so far. I'm sure someone will tell me in the chat if I do. Um, and then we do go straight to return after that. So this is the value uh, return value for base case. Great so far. So now we have to put our recursive case in here. Remember, I'm, I'm doing the kind of the, the best if else um, structure here. So I've got my, my test and then I test if it's true, and if it's true, I go down to the if, and if it's not true, I just flow straight through to the else. And the else here is going to be the recursive case. So this means I need to calculate fact r0 minus 1. So I need to step down through my, my parameter, minus 1 each time, and until I get to the base case. Now there's a few things I'm missing here, um, and I we talked about this when we were uh, doing our um, initial talk about functions and the stack. And the problem is, what's going to happen to LR if I then call another function? So I'm just about to get to my recursive case. I want to call the fact function again, but I'll need to do something with LR. So in fact, we've skipped a step, which is we haven't done like the correct function. Um, uh, preamble and an epilogue, or prologue and epilogue, which would sort of put values we need to keep in a safe place onto the stack and then get them back at the end. So I might just do that now. And the first thing I'm going to do is just push LR. And in fact, this is the only one we really need to deal with. Push LR at the top and then we pop it. So every push should have a matching pop somewhere in our function so that um, we are leaving the stack kind of. Um, untouched when we exit the function that everything has been removed or the, the position has been removed. So the first thing we do is enter the function, push LR so it's safe. Now we do our work um, and pop it when we need to return. Now we get into a little bit of a tricky case now because what I need to do is to calculate fact of R0 minus 1. So I'm going to sub r0, r0, 1. So that's r0 equals r0 minus 1. r0 equals r0 minus 1. Oops. And then I'm going to operate on that, bl fact. Okay? So this is going to be fact r0 minus 1. Well, now I've got a problem because I now need to do to take the return value from here, the return value is in R0, and my parameter, I needed to have kept that somewhere so I could multiply it by my return value, because I need to actually now calculate uh, R0 times R0 minus, uh, fact R0 minus 1. So I've got a problem, <laughs> and I can actually solve this very easily with the stack. What I need to do, I'm, I need to acknowledge that R0 contained a value that I needed to save for later. So I'm just going to push it to the stack before we do any of this, uh, any of this modification for it. Okay, so keep that keep parameter safe on the stack. Okay, and now when we need it back. That's easy enough. We can just pop it. Pop. I'm not going to pop it into R0 because that kind of contained the return value from this function. Um, and I might just pop it into R1 instead, right? As long as you've got a push with a matching pop, 
then you know that your the same value is going to enter there. So retrieve the parameter I was keeping safe. And now we can do our multiplication. Mal uh, zero is where I want the result to go. Uh, one uh, zero. Okay. And now we need to skip this base case stuff because otherwise that would just overwrite my R0. So I might put another um, label down here, just return. And then here I can go B return. Okay, a recursive function in um, in uh, assembly. I've made a big mistake right now, which is I forgot to press record in, uh, in stream, so I'm just gonna record it now. <laughs> I'll download the, the recording from streams later and make sure I have this on the website for you, but it's always frustrating when I forget to record. Okay, so should we test if this works? Um, what I want to do is uh, well, I'm just going to run my, my function and see. Um, I might just run it once and skip over the factorial function just to make sure that everything is working the way I expect it. So if I recall, factorial of 5 is 120. So if I just step over my BL function in a minute, that's 5 is loaded into R0. And I've set this to decimal already. Stepping over that, I get the answer, which is 120. So that's a relief. <laughs> um, Adam Rowland says, presumably this would also work with R0, R1 before the recursive call. Um, let's, let's have a look at that. If we move R0 into R1 before I go into the factorial recursive factorial call, what's going to happen when I go into that function? It's the same as the situation we had with LR, where we can move it into another register, yes, but if that other register is used one of, by one of our sub-functions, then we're in big trouble. It really does need to be on the stack. And the reason is that the stack keeps moving down and we are, even when we're recursing into another function call, the, the stack frame from the previous function is preserved so that when you ret return from that function, all of that stuff is still there on the stack. If I moved R0 into R1, and then we go down one level with the factorial function, then that level of the factorial function is then going to move its parameter into R1, and now we've overwritten it. So this is why we're using the stack, so that we have this kind of extendable memory that just keeps going down um, as we're calling function after function. Um, I hope that makes sense to you, but I'm, I'm happy to, to glance down at my screen and, and answer another question about it in a minute. Maybe we should just go through very slowly, stepping through each decision in this um, in this function. In fact, I'm going to do a, a shorter recursion. I'm just going to do factorial of two, mov uh, zero two, and here we go into the factorial function. So. First thing first, I'm going to push LR into the stack. Now compare to a zero. Don't go to the base case. We push R zero onto the stack. Now we just subtract one from R zero. Now we go back into the fact factorial function, doing it again. Compare again, does the same thing. Subtract one from R zero. Now we're going to be in uh, doing factorial of zero. So now we should hit the base case. Push LR, compare with zero, that's true. Now we get to go to the base case, okay. And now we're actually going to be doing the work. <laughs> um, probably you remember from these different types of recursion from, from previous classes, this is recursion where you're doing all of the work at the end of the function. So you're opening up all of these recursive cases and then doing the work and closing them all down again, uh, which is usually called tail recursion. So now we've moved R0 move one into R0 and we can do our return, pop LR, BXLR, and now we've ended up just after that one level of factorial function, 
come back up one level. Yeah, I totally can be anchor. Let's um, I can give a great a little demonstration of what the stack's going to look like in a minute. But I'll just get through this, and then I'll go to my blackboard and write it up. Pop R one. Um, so we're retrieving that parameter I was keeping, doing the multiplication, then we're going to return. Uh, go to the return branch. So we've got one more to do. Now we're popping uh, into R one two, which was the the sort of top value. And then we're doing the return from there. And now we've got our um, return value of two in our registers. So it's not very interesting, our two factorial is two, but it illustrated exactly how this structure goes. Okay, now there was a question about what the stack looks like with this function. So let me figure out a nice way to, to illustrate that. Um, I've got my um, my pen and my little tablet here, so we'll see if we can do it. So let's call this the stack over here. It's unfortunate that I've only got this chalk. I wish I had like a slightly more precise... I wonder if I can make it full screen. That would be even better, wouldn't it? Ah, oh, great. Okay. So over here, we have our fact function. Okay, and the, remember the first thing it did was push um, LR and then pop LR. I'm just going to sort of outline it here, not do all the work. BX LR, that's the return part. We got the base case here, which is going to be like mov. Uh, 0, 1, and then the work, got our compare here, I'm just going to dot 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 that, and the recursive case is some sub stuff, oh, sorry, whoops, first push uh, 0, then sub bl pop uh, zero and like just fitting in here the the mal. Okay, that's a really messy diagram of what this function is going to look like. But let's start here. We're at the top of the stack. So here's my first function. This is going to be fact um, two. So the first thing we do is put lr on the stack, right? For the, that's the fact two's lr. And then the second thing it does is put R0 on the stack. So that's actually going to be 2, which was the parameter, R0, for fact 2. <clears throat> now we go into... Um, pop R1, correct, yeah. Sorry, just catching up with the, the um, comments in streams. Okay, so now we're going to do our recursion. We've pushed that, and we sort of start into a new, a new function here. So we're now calling fact one. Okay, and the from the stack perspective, there's no difference. This is just a bunch of memory with some, some data hanging ha happening. But it's important to us that we sort of draw a little line here and say, well, everything after this point, is going to be fact one. So now the first thing we do is we pop push lr in push lr. And then we push one. Okay, now we're doing get into another recursive case. That's the R zero here. We do fact zero. Okay, and for fact zero, in fact, even though we need to haha, in fact, we don't really need to, but still we're gonna push LR. And that's because it's it's a recursive function, it just has to assume that it's gonna recur um, and call itself. It's it can't assume that it's gonna be the base case. <clears throat> so fact zero, we, we push LR, and then we don't do anything else, because we skip this part where we do the recursive case. So then we start returning. So when we return from stack, here's the stack pointer, or the stack pointer will be, yeah, there at this point. We start returning, 
So when we do pop LR inside fact zero, the stack pointer moves up one, one item. And then when we pop this one back, the stack pointer moves up another item. So you can see that every time when we exit a function, we sort of exit its stack frame, as we call it. A frame in the stack is all of the stack space which has been sort of claimed by a particular function and all of the sub-functions that it calls. So this is the stack frame for fact zero. It's a very small stack frame, doesn't contain very much stuff, just link register. Here's the stack frame for fact one. It contains link register in one, and it also sort of sub contains the, the sub stack frames. And here's the stack frame fact two, containing all those ones. So now we're in the stack frame for fact one. We pop one back into R zero, uh, into R one now this time, pop that in there. SP moves up. Then when we're done, we want to return from it. We pop LR and the stack pointer moves up again. And now we just need to pop two back into R1 in order to do our work. And then stack pointer moves up once we've done that. And then we finally return from fact two, returning back to main, which actually also has a stack frame because main is a function, right? So main stack frame, which we, you know, we don't know about. We, can, we know from our program that it's actually empty, but from the perspective of factorial, it might not be, who knows? <clears throat> yeah, so there was a question about whether you should be um, pushing a pop LR inside the recursive case. I suppose you could do that, but as we know, our calling convention suggests that we ought to do that first. It's the caller's responsibility to, to look after its own LR. Whoop. Just gonna wait a minute and see if there's any um, further thoughts about this uh, stack frame demonstration and recursive code. I'll bring up the code again so that you remember it. Oops. That was such a great question to, to just illustrate that stack right then. I think that really helped us all to be really clear about exactly what was going on. I'm not sure if um, everyone's aware, but I do actually put the code that I make in lectures into a repo on GitLab after the lecture. I worked out a good way to, to do that. Um, so this code will be there. And in fact, this is, it's something that I really encourage you to practice. Try a few recur recursive functions and make sure that you understand how to use the stack. I think there's a lot of times in this course where we do um, functions which are, or examples which are perhaps a little bit too small. They don't really force you to use the stack. But if you're doing recursion, you absolutely have to. Because as we said before, as we discovered, you don't know how many layers your, your recurrent recursive function is going to take how many recursive calls there will be. So there's no way for you to sort of prepare to have enough different registers to put your values into it. So if you can do pushes and pops for a recursive function, then you really understand how to, how to apply these calling conventions, even in the easiest case, like here, the factorial function. It doesn't get much more simple than that in terms of recursive functions, but it still exposes these interesting topics uh, or interesting concepts for you to get a grip on. Okay, I'm not seeing any more questions about this, so we might get on to the, uh, the next topic. Get that. So we're going to talk about assembler macros and a little bit about compilers today as well. Um, and this is a bit of a short topic. It contains a lot of demos. Um, usually week six is a quiet week. So, uh, you know, if it was a normal semester, there would be a mid-semester exam and the assignment deadline would be this week as well. So 
we sort of assumed that all the students would be doing um, quite a lot of that work and it's kind of weird that week six has been pushed to now. But never mind, that's, that's just how it is. Um, we sort of get back to more core topics, I suppose, next week. This slide says from macros to compilers, but in some way we, we're going a little bit the other way because we're going to talk about compilers first. But that's um, acceptable, I think, in this case. The, the idea of this lecture and, and the, the, um, the topics here is to start thinking about what a compiler actually does when it is taking something in a high level language, for instance, C or Java or um, Swift or something and turning it into um, machine code that your computer can understand. And in fact, you've started to be like a human compiler um, when you're doing your work in this class. And uh, for instance, in order to complete the assignment, you had to start thinking about if then and else patterns uh, and to do, um, you know, somewhat more complicated uh, mathematical operations to, to variables. So potentially you could have written assignment one in Java, for instance, um, a little bit more easily. You might have had more practice in, in handling if then and else in Java. And then you have to do it in assembly. You have to sort of work out what the compiler would do in order to make this happen on a CPU. Um, you know, the good news is, as you've discovered, many of the techniques can be applied to many situations. So there's lots of times where you have a pattern, such as if then else, which is repeated throughout a bunch of code. And once you've got the handle of it in one place, you can get the handle in, you can apply that pattern in another place. And that's kind of what happens with macros is that you kind of take one of these patterns and crystallize it in a sequence of instructions that the, um, the uh, crystallize it in a sequence of instructions that are kind of copied and pasted into your code wherever you tell that macro to activate. So that can help you to, to do something like if then and else or uh, some very quick copy and paste operations that you might have to apply many times in your code in some cases. And really the, the comparison here is that this is what a compiler does except the compilers operate at a much more clever level um, at the basic level, the compiler is copying and pasting sort of chunks of assembly code to, to accomplish what you've told it to do in higher level um, instructions. So the first little topic is this thing called the God Bolt Compiler Explorer. And I've got this in another, another tab, which we'll get to in a second. Um, the idea of this is it's a way of just exploring how a compiler generates assembly code from high-level programming. Um, there's some instructions here in the lecture slide about exactly how to use it. Um, I don't need them because I've, I've already worked it out. So here's what it looks like, the Compiler Explorer. It's on this website called godbolt.org. When I first saw Godbolt, I thought, oh, that's really cool. Like it's this kind of secret knowledge like you know, now as programmers, we can get in there and we can put a screwdriver on the God bolt and start really working out how computers work at some celestial level. But actually, it's just someone's name, which is it's a cool name anyway. But um, I didn't didn't get to imagine that it's uh, some kind of reference to keys to the universe or something. Now, the first thing we've got to do is change our output language here to be ARM. At the moment, it's generating x86 assembly, which is not what I want. So I'm just going to choose ARM GCC 8.3.1 for no particular um, uh, architecture or no particular system. And now I want to add a compiler flag. And I'm going to add O0, which means don't do any optimizations. So this is where we get to have some fun about, um, <laughs> about what compilers actually do to make your computer run faster. Um, they use all kinds of tricks to optimize assembly code so that it's as fast as possible. Now this is really nice because I've got this kind of boring function over here on the left. And when I look at each line, it kind of tells me exactly which part of the assembly code that line corresponds to. 
So you can see my the work here, return num times num, the input values, is this part where I've got a mul r1, r2, r3, and a mov. And then I've got my exit part or the at the end where I'm setting myself up to exit the function and it ends with a bxlr. And then I've got the input part at the top, the start of the function. Now this is just the, yeah, this is a very good question. Someone's just asked, what's fp? Well, we don't have fp in um, arm v7m. You would have fp in arm v something a. Um, there's slightly different, slight differences between the arm ISAs on your, um, on the kind of application level ARM or the ARM process is meant for like a whole full computer like a Raspberry Pi or a laptop or a phone. Um, and the one in your disco board is like designed for embedded applications and it doesn't need some things. So FP stands for frame pointer. And in fact, if I just go back to my slides, we just had this idea of stack frames, right? So we'd have, we, you know, we've got SP, LR, these are some special registers that contain an address in memory, PC. Um, FP is going to, another one of those. Um, we don't have it with our, our disco boards. Um, but it's got a certain purpose, which is that if we've got some function, right? The function. And this is its frame. The stack frame, the, the function itself will tr want to keep track of where the start of its frame is in the stack, even if it's been calling other functions and things are getting changed all the time. So the first thing you do is push LR, right, when you're doing your function. And then the second thing you do is push FP, or maybe you actually do it in the other order, so that your, your FP value is going to point to this location in memory. So it doesn't matter what happens in here, you can always access some important thing on the stack by referencing its offset value from the FP. Um, why would you need to do that? Well, I'm not, I thought I was going to be erasing. I want to erase, 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 erase. I might, uh, you know, as my function is starting, if I've got F of x, y, z, where f, x, y, z are the parameters, I might push those onto the stack so they're safe, all those parameters. And in fact, that's kind of what we're going to see happens in this Godbolt Compiler Explorer. So now I can reference, if I want to get x back later, I can call x by saying it's fp plus 4, fp plus 8. So I could find some way of offsetting from fp in order to obtain it, which is much more useful because the stack pointer by this point is going to be like down here somewhere. It could be stuck in a coming back from some subroutine. Um, and we don't know how far away these values are from the stack pointer if the stack pointer keeps moving. So it's good to have this location of the frame pointer kind of somewhere safe on the stack so that you can know where your um, values are. Um, back to the compiler explorer, which I've lost now. Yeah, so the first thing we do, very first thing we do is to store our frame pointer somewhere safe so we know where the start of our stack frame is. Then we move the, the, um, oh, what does that do? Nothing much. That's probably very unoptimized. It could be removed. Um, then we get to this where we're making some space on the stack. So the compiler knows exactly how much space it needs and it wants to save some space for this um, input variable and as well as the stack point, as well as the frame pointer. So it's keeping 12 bytes for this. And then it's gonna store my input variable on the stack <laughs> referenced by this, the frame pointer now. So now from now on, whenever I, in this function, it wants to reference any variable, it will do that with respect to the frame pointer. 
I guess it would be more helpful if it had push and pop, but um, because it's decompiled compiled it and then decompiled, you don't have those kind of nice ways of, of writing down things. So now we're doing the work. This is a really boring function, right? Just it squares, multiplies a number by another number. The first thing we do is get back uh, num, which was our parameter, into R3. And then we also get back num from R2 into R2. We do it twice. It's very suboptimal, right? Unoptimized code. And then we're going to multiply R2 and R3 together to get R1. And then put it into R1. And then we're going to move R1 to R3 for some reason, which doesn't really make sense, but okay. And now when we return, we move R3 into R0. So we're putting this value into the return area. And then we uh, do this um, kind of popping operation where we're getting back the, the original values that we had before we started this function. Uh, Mitchell's just put a, a good point the first line stores the caller's frame pointer. That's this one. And then the second pointer, the second line is add FPSP zero. We're now changing the frame pointer to point to the start of the function's frame. So this one is saving the caller's frame pointer and this one is restoring the caller's frame pointer. So it's, this one is, is actually uh, making sure that the caller's frame pointer isn't messed up. So it's, it's our responsibility as the callee in this ISA to look after the frame pointer. And then when we here's where we put it back, load back into the frame pointer where we stored it. And this is where we actually set the frame pointer to be our current stack location. Yep. Um, Mitchell says he doesn't know why this isn't a mob, which is totally fair, but you know, a mob add, they're both one instruction, so it doesn't make much difference. Now, let's uh, try something interesting. Just for this particular example, what if we make it more optimized? <laughs> so now we, all of that frame pointer stuff, putting the func parameter on the stack, that was, would be all really important if we had a much more complicated function, but we don't. So when we tell the compiler to, be, to optimize this, it goes ahead and removes all that stuff, which is unneeded. So it knows that R0 is our parameter. We're gonna just keep that safe in R3 for a second. Then we mull R0, R3, R0. We don't even really need to do that, but okay. And then we BXLR. So that's much easier. If I just go back to the O0, option for a minute. This, I guess this becomes more relevant if we have some uh, local variables like int a equals five, int b equals one, and then maybe we're returning, you know, a times b plus num or something. So we've got some local variables. So where do we store local variables when we're using a, we're doing some work in a function. Well, we store it in the stack <laughs> and that's what exactly what happens here. This local variable five, here it goes. We, first of all, we put it into R3 because that's all we can do. The, the, the load store architecture means that we have to move things into registers, move immediates into registers. We can't move an immediate straight into memory. Um, so we put it in this register and then it's stored on the stack. So then the register is now free. You can do something else with it. Similar with it, similarly with this one, moving R3, moving one into R3, using that same register and storing that right on the stack. And you can see that now our, um, our function has, the compiler has made sure that we have lots of stack space. We've moved SP all the way down to 20. Um, so we've got 20 bytes of space uh, to store our, our local variables. And it knows that because it can work out how much memory each of these variables ought to take. Now we can, uh, now we're doing the work. 
And because it's very unoptimized, of course, it's reloading these, these variables after it just put them there. That's okay. It's just a, a, a demonstration for um, our interest at this point. And it does this little adding operation. That's the B plus num. And then it loads back R2 and from the frame, from the stack, using the offsetting from the frame pointer and does the multiplication, then does the same return procedure. Should we try optimizing this now? Okay, something very strange going on now. So first of all, we, in one operation, add one to num, so that's b plus num, that's great. And now we need to do five times a. And I found out that it was doing this last night. How can we do five times this value, five times r zero, with an add operation? Well, this is clever, isn't it? We're using the add operation, but using the inbuilt shifting property of the add operation. Um, and we, and now, uh, first of all, before we're doing this, where, well, one of the operands gets shifted by two bits, and that means we're multiplying that operand by four. So we've got R0 times four plus R0 and putting that in R0. So that's five times R0 uh, <laughs> stored there. Really, really clever. A little bit non-idiomatic, which may, I guess means that if I was a programmer reading this assembly, and I see an add function, I don't assume that we mean we're multiplying something, right? So if you were writing that in your assignments, you know, maybe it'd be a good idea to put a comment in there saying, this means uh, zero times five, <laughs> if you felt like writing that. Um, otherwise, it's a little bit tricky to work out what's meant. Oh, Ooh. Mitchell says, this is exactly how multiplication is done in many CPUs called binary multiplier. I mean, the, the, the question is, I guess we haven't explored how the multiplication operator might work in, at a digital logic level, but um, you, you know, the, when you're multiplying things by two, you know we have to do a shift operation, and that's something which is easy for a CPU to do. And adding is something which is easy for a CPU to do because the ALU can do it. So I, I think the concept here is that multiplication is actually going to behind the scenes, use these components of the CPU um, in order to uh, ac achieve a result, which we look at as multiplication, and the CPU is looking at it as a bunch of shifts and adds. Yep, good point. Okay, I'm gonna do one more little example. One more little example, which was something that popped up on the, the forums last night. Uh, let's see if I can find it. <laughs> oh yeah, okay. So, I'm just gonna make another, this is gonna be a, a function called dumb loop. And I'm first I'm gonna make sure it's not optimized. So starting with this number five in a, or starting with a number zero, and we'll do a for loop, int i equals zero, i less than five, i plus plus, okay. So my for loop is gonna do something like this, a, Turn A. Okay. Now let's just have a little look at this loop because if we just by hand work out what's going on here, we're doing two times A to A, multiplying it by two a bunch of times. But if A starts at zero, then we're just gonna be returning zero. And there's no parameters here. So when I've got the non-optimized code, 
it's very cleverly gone and organized all of the the uh, all the um, organize all of the labels in order to break down my for loop into like the correct way of doing a for loop. Um, you can see we've got our return area here. Then this would be like the label for returning when the the um, comparison fails. That's this comparison i less than five, five. So when that fails, we drop through to the return. If it doesn't fail, the else case, we do um, the operation, which is multiplying a by two. So it accomplishes that with a, a shift left by one bit, um, just as we've been discussing in the in the chat. Um, And at the start, we're just moving a zero into a. So, you know, this is a lot of work to do nothing. And let's see what happens when we change this to the optimized compiler. And it moves zero into r zero and then returns. So the optimized compiler knows it can work out from that structure that we're actually doing nothing and that the answer should be zero. Very clever. Uh, it doesn't need to use these nice templates for putting all of our values in the, in the correct place. Okay, now I better get back to macros, otherwise I'm not going to talk about macros at all today. So if there's any more questions about how the Godbolt Explorer works, um, I really suggest you give it a try yourself, put a question on Piazza, and um, or bring it up in the chat right now. We can take the chat over to Piazza later, but it's really fascinating. It's a very cool tool for understanding how you might translate some high level code into um, assembly if you wanted to. But of course, it's gonna look like a, a total mess sometimes um, because it will either not optimize enough and you'll have a bunch of frame pointer stuff which doesn't work in ARM v7M or you'll optimize too much and have something which is like so slick that no one else will understand it. So it's, it's a tool with a, a a, a place, but it's only a little bit useful for, um, for our actual programming tasks. Now, the rest of this lecture is going to be only about macros. I said it was about macros, and we've finally got here. A little bit about macros. So what's the high-level view here? Well, macros are a tool for automatically copying and pasting code um, to repeat a repetitive operation. So you, you're doing something repetitive in your code. Oh, it's really boring. If only I had some way of just writing one line of code that would just copy in the 10 lines of code I need to, that's what a macro is for. That's the high level view. So the macro, uh, the macro operator can be, or, or procedure can be thought of as like this sort of mischievous kid with scissors running around your code and snipping out everywhere you've called the macro or written this this one line and then pasting in um, a bunch of extra code that you've defined somewhere else. Now there's some something really important to to remember about macros uh, which we'll I'll get to in a minute but that this kid is not actually the CPU right this kid is someone who's employed by the assembler, um, happening sort of in the VS Code, Codium world, in your tool chain. This kid gets in and does all of the snipping and the code is already snipped and pasted together before the, the CPU ever sees it. So you have to, to keep that in mind. It'll become more clear later um, why this is important. So the macro language is actually something completely different from our assembly instructions. It's a language defined by the assembler, AS. It's like a little programming language. Um, you can, uh, yeah, someone's asked in the forum uh, if macros are kind of like, like a function. We'll get to that in a minute. It's not. <laughs> um, the macro language is defined by the assembler. There's a couple of steps here. First of all, you just define your macro with these dot, um, macro and dot endm um, directives. You should know now that every time you see something like dot something in your assembly code, that's a directive to the assembler 
not an instruction for the CPU. Um, so you define your macro and then you call using it using its name. So the assembler, AS, copies and pastes the, ma the macro code um, and messes around with all its parameters if they're necessary into your program before generating the machine code. So before actually doing the assembly uh, process. Here's a general example of a macro. General example. So we've got our dot macro directive here and the dot nm. And then this is going to be the name, the first, first word here. Then we got a couple of arguments, arg a, arg b, dot dot dot, some other stuff. And then when we want to use these arguments inside the macro, you just put a backslash behind it. So if we need to do the an add operation with those two arguments, adds r zero, comma arg a, arg b. This is really convenient. We can define a little procedure here, which is copied and pasted into our code um, before it's run. So here's an example, a pretty dumb example, but it's it's a simple one nonetheless, just to get the, the concept right. So we've got a macro called swap, and its job is going to be to take the value in red one register and the value in the other register and swap them around so that we just sort of switch out our two registers. And our macro is going to assume that R12 is free to use as a scratch register. So that's a, a something about our macro, which we um, would need to worry about is that it would always overwrite something in R12. First thing it does is mov reg a into R12, then does the switcheroo, reg a into R, reg b into reg a, then R12 in, back into reg b. Very simple. Then when we need to call this, we would just type swap R0, R3. So R0 is going to be that one, and R3 is going to be this one. So the assembler, the assembler is going to copy and paste all these values into that text which we had in the other one. So snip out R0 and put that here and here, snip out R3, put that here and here, and then snip out this new couple of lines of text and paste them back into your assembly line. Now, the thing to remember here, the really important thing is it's exactly like you would use these three lines of code in your main.s file in the first place. Exactly like it. There's no difference from the CPU's perspective. This is the critical point. The CPU doesn't know anything about your macros. The CPU doesn't know anything about your macros. And this is why macros are different than functions. Because a, when a CPU sees a function call, BL to a link, um, it is actually doing this sort of journey, as we discussed in the functions lecture, into a different part of your code where this function is stored once and runs through that function and then comes back to the original program. If, if you used a macro for the same task, the macro steps would just be sort of pasted into your program in the same place. And it's actually kind of meaningful that a function is moving to this other part of memory and coming back. Just think about what happens if you used a function for something like swap, that swap operation, and you needed to call that function a thousand times in your program. Okay, we probably haven't called any functions a thousand times except for um, in your assignment where you were uh, doing the, the BL sample out routine, right? That function will be being called many thousands of times as your program runs. Now, if, you're, if you call this little swap macro a thousand times, those three lines are going to be copied and pasted a thousand times into your main.s file, into your main function. And your main function will end up really long and take up a lot of memory. Your function option, it only has to store it once. And then the CPU does the work of moving to that part of code, uh, that part of the program in another part of memory, and then coming back to your main function. So one of these is using the CPU to do this, this operation, and one of these is using our memory to do this operation. And just trying to unwind it, uh, unwind this operation of calling swap a thousand times in the past, uh, in before the CPU sees it, so the CPU has an easier job. Now, just for me, I prefer to rely on the CPU to do this function. 
And there's many cases where really that's what, what we expect you to do and what you must do. You, you can't do everything with, that you can do with functions with macros. So I might just, um, oh, we'll give you one more example um, with the, the macros or one instance where it could be useful, um, a particularly useful instrument is this idea of the, the if statement. So remember I was talking a little bit before about what, what compilers do. Sometimes they're going to take like a template and copy and paste that into the assembly program or the machine program, machine code program, in order to accomplish tasks which we do over and over again. And one task we do over and over again is do if then else, right? And I was really clear a few weeks ago, week four, about saying that you need to remember the best way to do an if statement. You need to remember the best way to do a for loop and a while loop so that you can accomplish this quickly in your assembly programs. But you, maybe you could use a macro for that. If you needed to do a lot of ifs and you were doing it over and over again in a limited kind of way, maybe you could get a macro to help you. So in this case, this is the best if statement. We had our label at the start just to, um, to, to recognize that it's the start of our if statement. Then we set the flags according to some condition. And if the flags were um, met, we needed to go to the, the then label, which would be down here after the else. And if they, the flags weren't met, we would go straight into the else area. And then when we're done with the else, we would go to the rest of the program over here. And if we were done with it then, we'd flow back down to the rest of the program naturally. Um, and this was just a great way of doing an else. So we can do this with, with macros as well. Here's an if macro. Um, and we're actually going to use the macro variables to contain some code, right? Then code, else code. So I've said condition code here because it's supposed to be a line, an assembly instruction um, that you'd need to use. And then condition is going to be the condition code we need. So the if macro is going to first have our setting the test code. Um, then it's got B with condition, then goes down to there. The then code is pasted in. The else code is pasted in here and we've got end if. And then that's the end of our macro. So someone's in the, in the chat just asked the question, is it better to use IT blocks or if macros? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. I'm just going to keep going with the explanation of this particular macro because there's a few details we need to understand. And the usage would be like this. If in inverted commas, uh, quote marks, comp uh, 1R2, so we've got a whole instruction stuck inside one argument there. And then the letters EQ is pasted into that. So we end up with BEQ. Molvar 31 is pasted into the then code. Molvar 30 is pasted into else code. So I guess, you know, this, this could be a one liner. If you had a very simple if then else um, sequence to do, you could do this in just one line. Now, a few things to note, um, as you saw here, the macros can sort of splice a parameter into the middle of an instruction. So that B condition becomes either BQ or BLT or BLE, you know, um, or BNE. And then whole instructions can then be treated as a single macro parameter. So compare R1, R2 is put into the condition code parameter, as long as you have double quotes there. Now, all of this is, is sort of a blessing and a curse. Um, the reason being that once you've done a, a macro, you can't actually step through it and debug it, right? You're, in your source code, in your source code, the only line you'll see is this one. That's the only one you get to look at. So when you go down your debugger, you skip down that line, it either works or it doesn't work. And you don't get to see all the details about what happens. 
So the fact that you've sort of squished, um, you know, three significant lines of code and then a bunch of other lines of code from a template into one can cause a little bit of an issue unless you know you're totally right here. So it can be a little bit tricky to debug. Oops. <clears throat> now, one issue is what might happen if we had two if then else's. So if we use this macro and we called it here, that's fine. It's going to paste in the, the label then and the label else, uh, label then and indef in our code. Um, and then if we use this macro again, we're going to have a problem because it'll also use the label then and the label and if. So we can't use that label twice. You're only allowed to use labels once in code. Um, and if we did, we did use it twice, the assembler, assembler wouldn't know which label we meant. So that's okay, there's a workaround. The workaround is to use this um, backslash at variable, this backslash at thing, which is gonna be a counter of how many macros have executed so far, and it'll put a number into the then here so that it's kind of disambiguated. Um, so there's exactly one then followed by some number um, for the assembler to deal with. So that means we can use this multiple times and the labels are all different and independent and the assembler is happy and our code ought to work as long as we do it correctly. You can get more complicated with this one, this stuff. You can um, use a for macro. Uh, this one, it's I guess it's not a complete for because you can't do anything you want in the um, in the little test. This for is going to just allow us to use one register to store the counter value and count between a low value and a high value and then do one operation, one instruction each time. I wonder if you can put multiple instructions inside the quotes. You probably can if you just put a little semicolon or something in between them. Someone in the chat will tell me in a minute. Um, you could also always read the, the assembler directive documentation if you want to know this kind of question. Okay, so here's our four, our four macro. First of all, we're, we're moving the from value, the low value, into our storage register. Then we've got a for label. First, we compare register to the two value. B, if it's greater than the two value, we escape to the end for. And if it's not, we run the body code. And then we increment our storage register and go back to the for. So that's very simple. And it's actually a great way to sort of start remembering exactly how a for loop ought to work. There's some great discussion on the chat about, um, about how, whether you should use macros rather than IT blocks. Yeah, I would say, I'm, I mean, I introduced IT blocks in week four because I think you should use them. <laughs> They're a great feature of this, um, this ISA and they give you access to a lot of very simple um, if then else patterns. If you just wanted if then else across a couple of instructions it's a great way to do it. You can feel cool using an advanced feature of your ISA and getting the CPU to do the job it was designed to do. So, cool. Yeah, the, the downside of the, the IT block is that there are some limitations on exactly what instructions you can use. Um, Mitchell points out you're only allowed to use BL instructions as the last line in those blocks. Whereas with a macro, you can do whatever you like. As we said before, that's a blessing and a curse. You're free to put in any instruction, but you're also free to completely mess it up and make it undebuggable. Some advanced macro syntax, you can do things like optional parameters, arg1 equals 500. Um, you can check whether parameters are present. So if arg1 wasn't present, then this, if uh, that would fail, I think that's if it's I've uh, forgotten what if b means. I'll have to look in the docs. Up, pseudo ops, if, oops, dot if. If b is dot if blank. So it assembles the following section of code if the operand is blank, 
empty. So I was actually, um, uh oh, now I've lost my, where I was in the, the all right, we're back. Check if parameters are present. This is actually checking if a parameter is not present, if it's blank. Um, conditionals and loops also work. You can also do recursion in macros if you want to, and I'll give you a demo in a minute. Um, if you want to feel extra wild, read the docs. You know, the, the, ascent, the macro, um, the AS docs aren't so bad. The AS docs is where you go if you want to understand, um, if you want to understand all of these assembler, directive, assembler directives, everything that starts with a dot, if you don't know what it means, go in here and have a look. It's a great resource. A few macro gotchas, we've talked about most of these. They're difficult to debug because you can't step through them. You need to be careful with names, clashing labels. Um, we've also already talked about that. Um, if you're gonna use a label as a parameter, you need to use a special separator. Um, otherwise the assembler thinks that the colon is part of the label name. Ugh. Um, as we discussed in my example before about using the swap macro a thousand times, if you did that, you'd end up with a lot of instructions. Um, and it's a little bit difficult to, to navigate the AS um, documentation, but that's not too bad. Um, the trick is that if you have a macro and it's not working, you, you really need to use the disassembler to actually work out what code has been called. So we'll, we'll try that in a second. So I think the, the issue here is that macros often look like functions in a higher level language. And I'm here today to tell you, do not be fooled by this appearance. Macros are a simple copy paste operation for doing very small tasks quickly. And in actual fact, macros are kind of old school. They're not very popular in, in um, kind of modern high level languages. People used to do macros all the time in C um, for doing all kinds of stuff. And there are all kinds of like macro anti-patterns that you have to be careful of avoiding if you're doing that in C. Um, the reason to be careful about doing macros in your assignments and submissions for Comp 2300 is that if you do a lot of macros, there's a risk that you write unintelligible code which the assessors can't read and don't understand and potentially getting yourself into um, issues with code that doesn't debug well. So it's excessive macro use is dangerous territory. Sometimes when we see an assignment submission or something that's like got a lot of macros in it, the alarm bells start ringing for whoever is marking that. So just be careful about that. If you're doing things with functions, it tends to be more modular and better structured. Um, what you have to remember is that when you're programming a macro, you're actually not programming the disco board, you're programming the assembler to put code into the correct way to put it into your disco board. So it's a little bit of a, a sneaky way to end up in a perhaps higher level language, but you're doing that work on your laptop or the computer you're using to develop for the disco board, not the disco board itself. So I'm gonna just do a one or two macro examples um, just to get the hang of what's going on. So I might do the swap example. I'm just gonna copy and paste it in just like a macro. Just like a macro. And then I might show you a recursion example because it's wild. Okay, so we've got our fact code there. I'm gonna keep that. I'm just gonna do a, a uh -oh. pasted too many things. So here's my macro. Now some people have discovered already that you actually need to make, your, make sure your macro is above, <laughs> above the code in the assembler that you want to use. So that can be a little bit, um, oops, a little bit frustrating. So maybe I'm gonna do move two into R0 and I'm gonna move 16 into R1, um, 15 maybe, 16 will do. And then I'm gonna just swap R0, R1, don't need any commas or anything, it's just using the uh, those little bits of text. Okay, first I move two into R0, cool. 
16 to R1, that's one zero in hex, and I'm gonna swap them. Ooh, it works, R0 is 16 and R1 is two. Now let's have a look in the disassembler and see what is actually going on. This is like Scooby-Doo. Now to find out who you really are. Disassembly. Okay, so I might move that over here. So I've got my main function. So at first I've got my NOP there, that's easy. Moving two into R0, moving 16 into R1. And now there's no swap command or anything. We've got our three commands, mov r12 r0, mov r0 r1, mov r1 r12. So it's really literally just copied and pasted these three lines that we wanted it to into um, our, our code here, which is handy, but um, sometimes confusing. The, the issue, as I said before, is that you can't step into the swap macro and see what it's doing and find out where you've made a mistake if you needed to. Um, you might end up doing something like seeing how it disassembles, copying the disassembly back into the function, seeing how that works, and then trying to reverse engineer it. So you can end up in strife. Um, how are we going over in the chat? I might just uh, see if there's a, a question or two to address uh, before going on to a slightly weird example of the recursive uh, macros. I haven't been looking at the chat in, um, in Restream for a while. I thought I had a little... Uh, I had a questions, question time thing. Does anyone got questions? Pop them in the chat for a minute. Oh, we had a whole bunch more. <laughs> There's a bit of discussion in the chat right now. I'll go back to my... Um, oops. There's some discussion about the chat about whether you might lose marks for not using macros and... Um, one of our tutors, Benjamin, says, no, avoid macros as much as possible. I think that's the, that's the general opinion. Like, I've sort of discussed them in, in theory because maybe they're, they're something you might see or there's something important about how assembly programming works and they're kind of a bridge between writing things in assembly and using a compiler, figuring out how templates would work to, to take your basic structure of your code and turn it into assembly. But if you're writing assembly, just go ahead and write assembly. It's perfectly fine. And in fact, our tutors prefer not to see macros. Cool. Um, I'm not sure if I'm missing anything or if someone's, if I'm missing something, then someone just yell out or at me in the chat so that I understand it. Because otherwise I'm just a bit um, confused about where we're up to in the chat. <laughs> Sometimes there are multiple threads going on. Someone was saying, well, is it possible to do a recursive macro? And I'm here to say it is. And I'm not sure if this is crazy or not, but I'm going to show you how to do one. So it's, just, it's so weird that I have to have it on my second screen so I can remember how to do it. So at the start of this lecture, we did the factorial function recursively in assembly, which is wonderful. And now I'm going to do the factorial function recursively in assembly macros. So we're going to make a macro. I'm going to call it factmac. And it's going to have one uh, argument, which is going to be number. And then, so here's my macro, just starting out with this happy little macro, it can go anywhere from here, it's just a nice landscape for us. So we've got to do some, our tests, right, to work out if we're in the base case or not. So my first test is going to be, yep, there's a bit of, make sure I can see the chat as well.
my first test is going to be this one. So it's oh, dot if ek. So the dot if function, um, it's a if then else thing, which will only work if the parameter is matches this condition code. So eq means the parameter is zero. So I'm going to do backslash number minus one is zero. So this one's just going to be based around the base case being one. I'm not going to do the base case being zero. Oh, I suppose I could, yeah. If eq number is zero. If it's zero, then we'll do this instruction, which is going to be mov uh, zero number. So we're going to put zero uh, in R zero. Now my recursive case, if it's not zero, we're going to check if it's greater than zero. Then we will do uh, a recursive call fact mac and I'm going to put in a expression which needs to be evaluated by the assembler. This is not being evaluated by the CPU on the disco board. It's being evaluated by the assembler and then put into code. So fact mac number minus one. Boy, I hope this works. Um, then we're going to move, just keep my number that I started with. In, this is after the recursive call returns. Wait a minute, I think I need to do this in the other order. Oops. I should. No, that's not going to work either. I thought I had this working, <laughs> but I guess I didn't test it. Uh, mov r1 number mal r0 r0. Oh, this is this is fine because that number is. <laughs> I thought I was programming assembly for a minute, and I got confused about whether things would be overwritten, but they're not. This is fine. And then dot and if. is going to be there. I need another end if after this one. Dot end if. I don't know what's happening with my um, indenting here. I'm just going to get rid of it all and put it all back later. So this is my fact mac function. I'm going to try what I expect this to do is to take in a number in the the function itself, so it would be fact mac five. In fact, I should put this before my um, my main function, shouldn't I? Whoops. I put in the number here, and then five um, factorial ought to appear in our zero. Let's see if it works. So just going through this in, in detail, fact mac five tests if five is zero. If it is, then it movs. I should do that. That should be one. And if it's not zero, mov r zero one. If it's not zero, and if in fact it's greater than zero, then we run fact mac number one, which is going to put number minus one, which is going to put our new number into R1 and then multiply zero by R1. So let's find out if it works. Okay. R0 equals 120. Boy, I wish I could step through this for you to prove that it works. But unfortunately, you're just gonna have to step through it in your brain because as I said before, we can't debug a macro <laughs> with the debugger. You just have to use your mind to debug it. Um, I'm still big. Oh, well, I'm becoming one with the code. That's okay, you can probably see it. I don't know. <laughs> uh, 
I'll move over here so you can see it, or I'll make myself small. Just in case you missed it, here is my fact Mac macro. We operate this by giving it one argument, which is the number we want to take the factorial of. Then basically we're generating code to do this multiplication starting in um, at the back end. So we're starting by um, opening up all these recursive calls and then moving our numbers into R1 and then multiplying them by R0 um, progressively. So we can actually see in the disassembler what this turns out to be. If I just run it again, Let's find out who you really are again. No, that's not right. That's the wrong debugger. Here we go. So we can see what this macro has done is it first moves one into R zero. That's the, after it's opened up all of these recursive cases. The first line it actually writes is R zero one. Then it puts one into R one, multiplies one by one, leaves the result in R zero, puts two into R one, does the multiplication, three into R one, does the multiplication, four into R one, does the multiplication, five into R one, right? So if I wanted to find the, the factorial of a thousand, right? I mean, this is going to overflow, but I don't care. <laughs> I just want to, oh, it, it wouldn't do it. It wouldn't even let me. Fatal error, macro is nested too deeply. I thought I could get away with it too, but um, in fact, I couldn't. Oh, that's a bummer. What's the maximum nesting level for macros then? Someone can tell me in the chat. Whoops. So I put um, fact Mac 100. Let's see if that works. Disassemble. Oh. oh no. Pressing random buttons doesn't help. Main. That's my other one. Oh, I want the, a new disassembly. Oh, what? I still can't. I've done something really bad here. What's going on? I just want one knob at the top of that. Okay. No one's complaining here. <laughs> I'm trying to now I'm step through my code and it's having a lot of problems doing that. Is it still going? I don't know what's happened. Oh no, we're done. So why can't I now disassemble my main function? Someone tell me that. I just still get the disassembly I had before. Well, anyway, if it was working correctly, you would see this being done a hundred times for each of those numbers, and we'd end up with a really huge main function. So in this case, <laughs> in this case, the recursive function version is definitely better than the macro version because the recursive function version only has to be stored once in one little bit of code. 
it does all its work, it uses the stack to store things, it's very, it's not the world's most efficient macro function, uh, the factorial function, but it'll do the job and it uses the, the CPU correctly. The factorial version is just all kinds of insane. Um, it's using way too much space, it's inefficient and it's undebuggable if it goes wrong. So that's all I'm gonna say about, um, about uh, <laughs> macros at the moment. Um, I guess we get to now have, you know, a few minutes chat before moving on to the end of the lecture. I'll just put, oh, there's, you can do some reading about macros if you want to. Um, I guess I'm saying that macros are part of this course. You should know the basics, um, understand how to create a macro if necessary for short tasks, but they're generally not a good idea to use in your assignments. Question time. <laughs> if anyone has any questions about the mid-semester exam or the structure of the rest of the course, now would probably be a good time to jump in. <laughs> Omnipotent Albert says, also look at all the mallets. Um, we've got a rather large mallet collection in this house. <laughs> this is only part one of the mallet collection, so... <laughs> the great mallet collection is um, a sprawling endeavor. Not getting any... Um... Someone says, can I play the marimba? I can play the marimba. That's why I have the marimba, so I can play it. Um, someone asked, is there a list of practice questions we should disregard? Uh, no, there's not a list of practice questions you should disregard. Some of the practice questions have small errors, like the, the value they ask you to, to, um, to calculate will overflow or something, or they maybe one of the true false answers was a little bit more complicated than that and you know both answers could be true but in general i think that there there isn't anything in there you should disregard in terms of them all being about material that you that has been covered in the course so far and that's fair game in terms of examination um, the only thing i will say is that in last year's practice exam 2019 there were there was one question about data structures which we haven't done yet in this this structure of the course so you won't see data structures until next week um, and that was a question about like storing a bunch of ints in an array in memory we haven't done talked about arrays we haven't talked about storing ints in memory and how much space they'd take up so that's the only question we haven't done i think Oh, a study session for the for the quiz. Practice quiz scared you a lot. So someone's saying that it's scary. A study session for the quiz is a great idea. Um, in normally the um, normally we would have something organized with the CSSA, but I guess we're not doing that. So maybe I'll organize a study session on one of the evenings um, that you guys can can take part in. Um, but it's. Uh, I'll just have to discuss with the tutors the right time for that and we'll have a few people out there to help with questions. Someone says, how many exam questions can we expect? Is that the same amount in the practice quiz? Um, uh, the total amount of marks in the practice exam was 60 and I think that's what I'm looking at for the, the, the 90 minute quiz. So that would be 12 questions, yep. And I probably will have, you know, some of those will be multiple choice, some of those will be code, some of them will be theory. Yeah. Any other questions about the practice exam or... Uh, 
other things. P.S. Um, I'm not sure if you will have realized yet, but if you go to the deliverables page on the course website right now, you'll see that there's more stuff. And in fact, I've just released the text of all of the assignments for the whole course now. So there's assignment two, text is available. Assignment three, text is available. I wouldn't say that these are completely ready because I haven't put the due dates in. And in fact, if you're trying to access the, uh, the GitLab template, it doesn't let you, the template's not ready, but you can um, have a look at the background and start thinking about these assignments. Um, and hopefully that just helps you to, to structure your study for the next um, seven weeks of semester because it's a big one. Um, someone's saying, any way to get some example answers for some of the questions? Uh, I find it a lot easier to answer questions where I understand the format for it. Yeah, that's a, a good point. I might make a one example answer for one question. I don't want to put a... Um, first of all, I don't, don't have um, prepared answers for all of the questions. Um, I don't want people to think that for questions there's only one possible answer because often I'm continually surprised by things that you folks come up with in exams. Um, there are many questions which are open-ended and require, you know, thinking about different different angles. But you know, for the all the short answer questions, they're all going to be five marks. So what we're asking for is, you know, some examples and maybe like two paragraphs explaining why this works, right? It's not a hugely long essay, um, just about, if you're handwriting it out, it would be like one page of handwriting on one of those um, exam pages. Yeah, well, I think the questions have calmed down now, so I might go to the outro and you guys can